right, so today I want to follow up on the talking I did uh, yesterday. I will give a little bit of a repeat because a lot of folks weren't here, but I'm going to definitely orient it much more towards, you know, let's, let's nerd out and uh, get serious about it. Uh, uh, as always, uh, I start at the end because once I get on a roll, I have no idea how long it's going to take me, and so it's best to let you know uh, the takeaway at the end. The takeaway for the end is we are computing wrong. Our computer architecture, by which I mean CPU and RAM, is a beautiful, simple, stupid, dangerous, obsolete horror. <laughs> but even the guy who invented it said it would be gone soon. And he said that in 1950. And we're still doing it. For scalable computing, for securable computing, Number one, we have to give up on this idea of hardware determinism. We have to give up on this idea that the computer hardware guarantees to do the same thing twice. And I'll talk about all of these more. Hardware determinism is for the fragile. Centralization is for the small. And that's the real problem. The whole idea of a CPU, central processing unit, means one guy is doing everything. Well, what's the problem with that idea? Well, the problem is, he can only go so fast. And if you get four guys, multi-core, now they have to coordinate. Did you change that? No, he changed that. It doesn't solve the problem either. Synchronization I'll come back around to. And then cybersecurity. Yeah, this is the thing. I mean, basically the idea of RAM random access memory. Every location in memory is the same distance from every other location in memory. That's what random access means. That's the whole point. If you've got a pointer, you can go anywhere. That's insane. It's like I could stick a finger and poke you in the gallbladder. Uh, uh, you wouldn't really want to let me do that. And it should be impossible for me to do that unless I have gallbladder doctor power or something. But the way we've designed computers, everybody who's running on the same CPU, every instruction from our most secret, private medical information to the scum of the internet exists at the exact same square centimeter of silicon. It all goes in the exact same place and by the grace of God we didn't manage to divert the control at once. It's crazy. It's insane. 50 years from now, I hope nobody will believe this is how we computed back in the Stone Age of computing, which is where we are now. All right, that's my basic takeaway. How are we going to get from here to 50 years from now? We're going to get here with this idea of indefinitely scalable architecture, and that's what I want to talk about today. I want to say what the idea is, and the idea, unlike most of my ideas, is actually quite crisp. It's actually quite specific. You might not like it, or you might think it's a silly idea, but hopefully it should be clear what the idea is. Here's the, the high order tag. The idea is an indefinitely scalable computer architecture can be grown. You can add more and more arbitrary amount of hardware that you can add to it and never run out of anything. As long as you have real estate, money, power, and cooling, you could make the machine bigger by plugging in more basic tiles, basic units. A computer from here to the horizon a computer from here to Jupiter, if you want, and never run into a 32-bit address space limit, never run into clock distribution tree problems. Okay, that's the idea. Once we do this, once we accept that the only thing that's admissible as a computer architecture is something that has this property of indefinite scalability, certain other things happen. Number one, hardware determinism departs. 
no matter how much we are willing to spend on a given piece of tile to make it as reliable as we can, there still will be some failure rate. One in a million, one in a billion, one in a billion per year, whatever it is. And that means if we have more than a billion tiles and we run them for more than a year, there will be failures undetected by the hardware delivered to the software. And that's the violation of hardware determinism. Okay. Once we have indefinite scalability, we are going to have to deal with undetected hardware errors at the software layer. Are we having fun yet? Uh -uh. What that means is we've been pretending when we teach algorithms and we sort numbers, we pretend that we guarantee that these numbers are going to be correctly sorted. I swear on my mother's pile of numbers uh -uh, that these things are sorted. And how can I do that? I can do that because hardware swore to me that it would do exactly deterministic right, exactly follow the laws of logic without fail. And if it couldn't do that for any reason, it would crash the entire machine, and then we all agree everybody's dead, and so there's no sin. The only sin is to create a mistake and not crash. That's the rules we have now. Once we can no longer do that, once we can no longer actually give an ironclad guarantee that we're going to do the right thing, we have to admit there's going to be some chance we're going to get a wrong answer. And that's what we say software becomes best effort. All you can do is you say, well, if everything else is okay, if the hardware is good and there's enough time and the data isn't changing too rapidly, then my answer will settle down to the right answer and we're all good. But I cannot guarantee you, I'm sorry, I can't guarantee that these numbers are in the correct order. And in fact, nobody else could either, but we just used to pretend when we were children. But now we're growing up. Okay. Once we can no longer have hardware be deterministic, once we admit that software and hardware are best effort engineered, that's all we can do, then what I suggest is the way we're going to build software, software is going to look like artificial life. Meaning, software will automatically compete with other software to reproduce itself, not just for more performance, but for robustness. So in case there's some errors in one of them, that's okay. I got cousins that are doing this too. As long as any good bunch of us can get the answer collectively, we're still good. So in the future, where we're heading, this is the story. Software is going to be alive in that literal sense. It's consuming energy, reproducing for performance, possibly for evolution. Oh, that terrifies me as wearing my engineer hat, wearing the scientific hat. Ooh, let's put random things in and see what happens. You know, engineer goes, are you nuts? These things are real. They're consuming energy. They're taking space. Eventually, they're driving your car. Uh, uh, no, we don't want evolution. Well, maybe we do. Fundamentally, what I'm saying is this is a whole other way to compute than what we've done now. Eventually, we'll start seeing similarities. So eventually, we'll say, oh, well, you know, once you have this thing made out of cells that are competing and blah, 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 you know, you can kind of implement sort of a little teeny finite state machine here. It only uses 20 billion gates to implement a three-state machine. But, man, it's a really robust three-state machine. You know, you can taser it, and it still says, I'm in state two. Uh, uh, that kind of thing. That's the whole story. So, if you don't want to stand, you got the main point. <laughs> uh, 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 now let's unpack it a little bit in our remaining time. Uh, um, okay, so what I want to talk about today is this idea of the two attractors. The, there's fundamentally different ways to compute than the way we're doing it now. All righty. Uh, uh. That's the two attractors of computing. The consequence of that is we have to give up on this idea of strict correctness. We have to give up on this idea that we have cherished, that numbers must be exactly guaranteed 100% correct, or else they're crap. We have to say there's intermediate. These are numbers are kind of sorted. You're welcome. Uh, uh, 
Is that good enough for you? Well, it's up to you. This is my best effort. Take them or leave them. A joke. But this is how society works, right? You never get these actual proof guarantees. This is not wheat. This is white. No, no, it's wheat. Well, okay, I'll eat it anyway. Uh, uh, my head doesn't explode, hopefully. <laughs> Out with strict correctness, in with strict and definite scalability, and this is what I've been talking about, uh, unpacking this idea, and then try to actually get into, well, once we are talking about computation, not as an abstract PRAM model, not as an abstract something of bits and RAM and so forth, but a physical device, we can now characterize that physical device like any physical device. How much does it weigh? How many watts does it dissipate? And so on. And we can compare computers, not in terms of MIPS, but in terms of MIPS per watt, or MIPS per gram, and so forth. Now, of course, an um, um, instruction on A and an instruction B could be very different creatures. But we're going to blame that on the first person to talk about MIPS as if it meant something. And we'll have that same flaw. Still, a billion MIPS is better than one, almost surely. All right. Let's talk about the first one. So the two attractors. And again, I did talk about this yesterday in the context of life, but uh, so I'm going to try to cruise over it a little bit quicker. Uh, um, if anybody wants to jump in, if anybody is bold enough to try to stop the train uh, and say, uh, what the heck was that word? Uh, uh, I would love to have questions if you want to jump in. Uh, otherwise, I just go faster and faster and faster <laughs> until we all crash. Uh, uh. All right. So I've already talked about this, so just to sum it up. Hardware determinism. This was the fundamental contract of computing. Hardware turns physics into logic. Software turns logic into money. That's the idea. And the money has to be enough to pay for the software and the hardware together, plus 10% for management, uh, um, or whatever. Okay. And if that works, if the logic from the physics leads to enough desirability so that there's enough money to stabilize the whole system, then computing works. Digital computing works. And it's been great. Digital computing, Negroponte, six or seven years ago, said 10% of the world economies now, something like that, is tied to computers. It's been an unbelievable success story. But from the beginning, and again, we learned this, if we didn't know it before, in the lecture yesterday, one guy, one lonely voice shouted out that this is wrong, this is not the future for us, and it was von Neumann. In the future, the actual lengths of chains of operations will have to be considered. You cannot use billions and billions of instructions just to put the queen on the king in solitaire. Because that's stressing this idea of determinism. We need to keep the programs short so that there's a reasonable probability that none of the instructions will screw up before we're done. And number two, we're going to have to allow the idea that operations may fail. We may say is one less than two, and get the answer no. Just every once in a while. I'm trying, I really am. But, you know, there was a cosmic ray or, you know, something on TV. And I got it wrong. You know, sue me. Best effort. So what it comes down to is I suggest to you there are these complementary, largely complementary approaches to computing, that you can line them up across all of these dimensions. And I call the first one finitely scalable and the other one indefinitely scalable. Finite versus indefinitely scalable. And they have different language, different emphases all the way through. Finite scalability is traditional computing. It focuses on algorithms. You give me an input and then you wait. You stop. Hold the world constant and I compute. I am the computer. And when I'm done, and you just wait, I give you the output. I say, this is guaranteed correct. You're welcome. Uh -uh. That's the algorithmic approach. In indefinite scalability, the corresponding part is the process. 
It never begins. It never ends. It's sitting there responding to inputs, getting messages, sending outputs. It has some state. It might respond differently this time than it did last time. Who knows? But the last thing it wants to do is exit. The whole point is never exit. Algorithm versus process. Finite scalability. We say the number one thing is it must be correct. If your output isn't correct, we can't even talk about it. You're in some state of logical sin unless you have a proof that your algorithm works, that your output is correct. In indefinite scalability, that's not the requirement. The requirement is you give some answer. The requirement is don't die. The requirement is be there to say something. And once you say something, the goal is <laughs> to say a true thing, to say the right answer. But that's secondary. And then finally, if you're definitely there, and you're probably right. Your, your constraint is you'd like to be efficient about it. All other things being equal, you'd rather save your energy for a rainy day just in case. Robust, then correct, then efficient. Versus what we know and whatever we do with, where we say it's not even admissible as an algorithm until it's correct. If it's not correct, we don't even know what you're saying. You're, you're just babbling. And once we know it's correct, then the goal is to be as efficient as possible. And then given that it's efficient as possible, you then may have to make it as, if, as robust as necessary. You go back and say, oh, well, it turns out there might be an error in one of these bits. Uh, the comparison might be wrong. Let's do the comparison three times and vote whether we want to go true or false. You armor where you need to armor. Okay? All the way down. Two approaches, almost duels in how they work. All right? And the takeaway, the short story, the outrageous concept I'm trying to suggest to you is we are in the wrong attractor. We are in the finite attractor, and we want to be in the indefinite attractor. And the current state of computer hardware development, as was mentioned in the abstract for this talk, increasing clock speeds for CPUs are slowing down. Or you have to go to seriously heroic engineering like liquid nitrogen uh, uh, to get your CPUs to go 5 gigahertz or whatever it is. And on the flip side, that we cannot, for the life of us, make a secure computer. Both of those come from the fact that we are in the finitely scalable attractor for computing, and we have massively overscaled it. We've taken it far beyond where it wants to be. It's like we had this cute little one-celled animal 50 years ago. And now we have this hideous blob, still one-celled, but gigantic. And it's just not working so well. And we're saying, let's let the blob drive the bus. That's where we are today. It's crazy. It's really crazy. Okay, so that's it. That's my mission, my research mission, my career, to make this point as compelling as I can, as broadly as I can, and to make it as credible to think it might actually be possible to compute on the other side, and to try to get people interested and build frameworks and mechanisms that people can start to contribute to learning the engineering building the body of knowledge that we need to understand how to be useful computations on indefinite scalability. That's the story. All right. So that quote from von Neumann that we'll have short programs and they'll admit failures, that's 65 years ago, 68 years ago, something now. Why is he still wrong after all that time? Why are we still in the finite attractor? And fundamentally, it's because we do what we know, we train our students with what we know, and for the longest time, we were able to get times 10 in the clock speed, times 10 in the memory, relatively cheaply. Design lock-in and network effects, I suggest, account for the reason why Von Neumann said we were going to switch, give up on hardware determinism when we got to 10,000 gates in a chip. It wasn't chips, it was tubes. 
Uh, uh, and we're not even close. We're at a billion gates, and we're still trying to make the central story go. Part of the, when you say design lock-in, it's easy to say, but what it really means is there's all these assumptions that go into how we build computers, how we program them, how we judge them as good or bad, that mutually support each other and make it difficult to move away from this approach. Okay? And here are several of them. The idea of strict correctness, I'll talk about that just a bit more in a second. Random access memory, I already talked about that. Random access memory is great because in step one, you completely ignore physical space. You say, it doesn't matter in the least where this thing lives. Here, 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 here. All you need is the address, and it's equally good. So in step one of computer architecture, we eliminate space. And then in step two, we go, oh, a buffer flow, overflow. How did that happen? Well, we didn't really eliminate space. We just hid it from ourselves. And in fact, at the end of the object, there's another object. It's all still living in space. You overflow one object, you're in another object. But we don't know that. Why? Because we threw it away. We thought random access was such a great idea. See how it works? And you never even think it through. The idea that reliability is a hardware problem. When you add up a bunch of numbers, do you add them up twice and make sure the answer comes out the same? That's what your elementary teacher told you to do. Uh -uh. Does your computer program do that? No, it would be stupid. Why? Because reliability is a hardware problem. If you were to write software to say, oh, let's add them up three times and make sure we got the same answer, everybody would know you were a fool because you were being inefficient. As long as you have the hardware determinism guarantee in your pocket, you are covered. If it ever turns out that you get the wrong answer, it's his fault. Sue him. Bankrupt his company. I am covered. And that's explicitly what best effort hardware takes away. Best effort hardware says, oh, sir, I really tried. One is greater than two. I mean, no, it's less. No, it's greater. Uh -uh. That's it. And once you say that we've changed the deal, now the pressures on software are totally different. Software doesn't even need to respond for 250 milliseconds because it's responding on user human input, a click of a button. It could add up the numbers 10,000 times and nobody would ever notice. And now it would matter. We would do it if we could, if we knew we had time to do it. And we would only do the magic super efficient, never do anything twice, make one little peek and then go crazy if we were desperate, if we were clawing our way through the desert trying to survive. What is the biggest number in 12? If you absolutely have to be efficient, then you be efficient. But you expect you're at death door when you get to that time. Living systems will be 30 times redundant, 50 times redundant, most of the time, except in those moments of great drama. And we'll focus on them in the stories, but we're not going to engineer for them. Okay? All right. Okay, here's an example. This is one of the first things I did. This got written up in a viewpoint in the communications of the ACM several years ago. Sorting. Let's consider pairwise sorting. But suppose the comparison operator is only right 90% of the time. Okay? Uh, um, and you're sorting a deck of cards, a standard deck of cards. Are you going to get the right answer? What do you think? Think the odds are good? No, odds are not good. I mean, are you going to get right answer one in a hundred times, maybe? It's going to be pretty damn small. Okay? And the important point is, if we're saying strict correctness, if we're saying you must be exactly right, or you're just being incoherent, that's all we can say. You're not going to get the right answer. Go away. There's nothing more to say. But if we go beyond that, if we take a robustness approach, we go further. What we have to do is give up on the idea of strict correctness, meaning yes or no, 100% correct 
or 0% correct and come up with something, I don't know, let's call it partial credit. Well, you got the answer wrong, but you showed good effort. So here's an example. Suppose here's some numbers that are allegedly ordered, and what we do is we compare how many positions they are out of order. This guy is the smallest. He's supposed to be in the first position, so his positional error is zero. This guy is where he's supposed to be, so forth. These guys are switched, so the first one is off by one. He wanted to be here. Second one's off by one. He wanted to be there. We add them up. Positional error of zero means you got it right. Positional error of two means adjacent guys were swapped. Positional error of eight, in this case, is the worst case, means you got them exactly backwards. There's a couple of ways to get maximum positional error. This is one of them. All right? So now, if the positional error is zero, you're definitely correct. And if the positional error is not zero, you're definitely incorrect. But we can now distinguish a little incorrect from a lot incorrect. So we took traditional sorting algorithms and sorted a deck of cards using a comparator that was right 90% of the time and graded the result with positional error. Ooh, hard to see. Y-axis is the average total positional error in the deck over 52 cards. Okay, so the average case, if the deck was actually shuffled, it would be up here around 900 or something like that. I don't remember exactly. With quicksort, we got an average positional error, maybe 250, something like that. Merge sort was actually under 200. Bubble sort. <laughs> incredible, ridiculous, black sheep hated bubble sort. <laughs> yes? How do you know that the graders would make a mistake? Because the mistakes that were made here, we programmed in. No, I'm saying the real... Oh, oh, not in the simulation. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, that's a, it's a great question. And, you know, fundamentally, when you start to say, I'm going to add extra checks, I'm going to add up uh, multiple ones, now you have an additional question. What if the guy who's doing the majority rule gets it wrong? And this, again, just like almost everything, goes all the way back to von Neumann, showing that the additional hardware required to do the voting is basically logarithmic in the amount of information that you're merging. So as long as each individual gate is greater than two-thirds chance being right, 50% plus epsilon, I don't remember the details, you can actually show that it will converge. So even though the majority thing might fail as well. And basically, there's this, always this big trick, right, that whatever you do at the very last minute before you send the output out, if that fails, you're dead. You know, no matter how many times you did it, if you tried to write six, uh, on the answer key, and the guy next to you bumped you and you wrote nine, all your great work, well, unless there's partial credit. Okay, so here's the point. Everybody knows bubble sort sucks. Why does it suck? Because it's inefficient. Well, so what? It took no noticeable time to bubble sort a deck of 52 cards. Now, again, if we were in a circumstance where it was happening in the inner loop of something else, blah, 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 bubble sort could be completely unacceptable. And that's the e example of I'm using the machine to its absolute possible stuff, and so I'm doing all these dangerous, dangerous things like not checking my work. And in traditional computing, we think about that all the time. We do worst case thinking. That's what it means. Worst case. But most of the time, is not worst case. Most of the time, we have tons of time. We could do bubble sort and be much, much, much happier. This is a striking result that you cannot see if you're thinking strict correctness. If there's no partial credit, these are all infinity. These are all max. Okay. That's the idea. All right. So, bottom line. Efficiency is not a good. It's not an unalloyed virtue. It's a regrettable, sometimes necessity. When computers were young, in von Neumann's time, they were incredibly expensive and they really sucked. And you spent hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, I don't even know, to build these things, and then you wanted to get as much computation out of them as you possibly could, 
So you turned yourself inside out to make efficient code. But we are in a completely different universe now. We got computers coming out of our ears. Take a guess how many computers are in the room here. Hundreds? Way more than the number of people. And it's only going to get worse. And they have more cycles than they need for almost everything they're doing. Except, you know, yes, yes, you're watching videos and playing a game and... Okay. Good question. Shoot. So, yeah, so for a screen sort, you know, it does much as comparison than bubble flow. So if I were to run screen sort as... Yeah, so right, right. So suppose, I, suppose I ran this ten times, and I'd still be doing less comparisons than one bubble sort. Would that include the error? It absolutely would. And here's another approach. Why don't I just take quick sort, but every time I get a pair of dies, just punch it into the comparison three times, and then take a majority rule and have that be the result of the comparison. Right? And, and when we're thinking with traditional computing head, and that's exactly the kind of thinking that we want to do, then we say, no problem. In 90% uh, correct, well, you know, let's do best of seven, that'll drive the probability down, do the binomial and everything, and then we, we're right back to the party. Because now we'll drive the chance that we'll get more than half of the 90% chance wrong is down to the level of it's likely to not happen even once during the time it takes to do the sort. But that made one key assumption. It assumed the failures were IID. It assumed the failures were an independent random variable, which is a perfectly reasonable assumption to make. But did I ever say that? Did the universe ever say that? Suppose you did that, and you made everything work great, but then it turned out there was a weird failure in the comparator which is actually this kind of steampunk mechanical thing, that in addition to having a 10% chance of getting the wrong answer, it also has a 50% chance of just returning the same answer it did last time. The little output lever just gets stuck. And it just says, true, 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 no matter what you put in. Now your brilliant idea of punching it in seven times goes out the window again. Because now you have bursty errors, you have runs of errors. Okay. And then you say to yourself, oh, wait, wait, I can figure that out. I will uh, dovetail all of the comparisons together. I'll do read Solomon coding on the thing. And yeah, you can do that. But think of what you're doing. You're attempting to bag the universe into saying, you must tell me what the possible errors are. And if I can get you to tell me what the possible errors are, I will compensate for them with the exact minimum amount of redundancy, and I'll get my determinism back and I'll go home. So, strict indefinite scalability, where is it here? All right, let's get on to that. Do we have a thing? Well, it'll be coming up in a minute, but the key point is, in best effort computing, do we actually see the best effort computing slide? I can't even remember. Best effort computing says you try to get the right answer, but you reserve the right to give the wrong answer, and furthermore, your errors are uncertain. If anybody asks you, what is the distribution of your errors? The answer is, I don't know. It could be anything. It could be an oracle out to mess you up. And the reason for that is expressly to defeat this kind of thinking. Where we say, ah, what is the error model? You tell me the error model and it's all good. But we don't know what the error model is. And in the real world, we can't know what the error model is. Because in the real world, if nothing else, there is malice. There is somebody who is as good as an oracle who's going to come up with that run of seven failures in a row just to mess you up. Okay. All right. So here is strict and definite scalability. This is the precise idea. Given an indefinite supply of real estate, power cooling, and money, invent a computer architecture based on hardware tiles, completely identical to the degree that we can make them so by manufacturing processes that can be usefully deployed at any scale. Any number of tiles can be plugged together as long as we have real estate to lay them out, power and cooling to run them, and money to buy them, without ever re-engineering. And then there's one little footnote that says you're not allowed to change the mass of a tile. 
the mass of the tile must be constant, and the cost of storing one bit is greater than zero. Okay? That's it. That's the whole game. So you try to think about how would you make computing work like that. All right? Now this, uh, uh, I love, it's not PowerPoint, but I love it anyway. Uh, uh, all right. I, I, I do this talk and I say, so tell me what you're thinking of. People think of like supercomputers, not even close. Supercomputers in general have been scaled just about as big as they possibly can at whatever level of reliability and cost their fundamental tile is using. And if it wasn't, they would have made it bigger. So in fact, every time you want to double the size of a supercomputer or times a thousand, you have to reinvent the whole thing, basically. <coughs> it's finite scalability on steroids. The internet, that's the, the number one answer up on the board. Internet, internet in, indefinitely scalable. You can keep adding more nodes, keep adding more nodes. What do you think? Is it indefinitely scalable, yes or no? No? Why not? Routing. What about it? There's, there's problems with uh, figuring out where everything is at any given time. And if you add things and remove things, you have to update that table. Well, that's true, but there are methods. BGP will do it. Does it, does it actually get slower as the thing gets bigger? But it's slower than uh, uh, well, one end to the other, and one person to we have to come up with what, some notion of what we believe the cycle time is of the internet. Because if it's going to grind to a halt, then we're going to be unhappy with this. But there's a bigger problem. There's a more obvious problem. Address space? Absolutely. Who said it? Yeah. Uh, um, IPv4 is basically already blown out. I mean, long since blown out. IPv6. Merely 64 bits, 10 to the 38th addresses. How long would it take to fill the universe from the sun to Alpha Centauri with a, a sphere, a concentric spheres of 10 to 30 addresses? Not long. So the internet is only finitely scalable because, number one, it assumes a global address per node, and number two, that address is finite width. And even if you thought, well, hmm, Suppose I had a self-terminating string, so the, na the addresses could get bigger and bigger and bigger. Whoops! Our tiles are finite mass. You can only have so many bits in them. Eventually, all of the bits will be tied up remembering what this guy's address is, and you're still dead. Okay. So for indefinite scalability, you have to give up on the idea of having unique IDs, globally unique IDs. Turing machines, you know, you just keep buying more toilet paper to feed into the thing, uh, uh, and so on, uh, uh, assuming it was actually really real. Uh, um, same sort of problems. And then finally, the one that's relevant for the, oh boy, uh, uh, remaining uh, zero time of the talk, cellular automata. People familiar with cellular automata? Uh, uh, some people refuse to raise their hand. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. uh, is anybody in the room? Uh, I see. Okay, we have one guy in the room. All right, just just that was an honesty check. Uh, um, and uh, uh, of course, the answer wasn't reliable. Yeah, 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 yeah. But actually, it was closer to one minus the answer. So, uh, uh, but so the takeaway from all of this is, boy, Ackley's a real jerk. You know, 10 to the 38, that's really big. That's more than there are atoms in the entire planet. You know, you could assign an IP address to every single atom on the planet, and he's not happy. Well, that's the whole point of strict and definite scalability. It's a, it's a theoretical notion. And it forces you to say, well, what would you have to do if you couldn't have unique node names? It doesn't solve any of the problems of networking. It doesn't solve any of the distributed networking problems, but it forces them all on the table. You can't hide them. You can't pretend you have global routing. You can't pretend you have constant latency links between any pair of nodes. Those are not physical. You can't have them. It's not indefinitely scalable. Okay? That's the way it works. And by doing this, by being strict, it will lead you home. 
it will lead you out of the correct and efficient attractor and force you to start thinking about indefinite scalability and all that other stuff. Robustness. The things may fail. Dealing with incomplete information about who the neighbors are. Not even knowing the neighbors. Neighbors don't have names. That guy, his name is West. His name is East. We could start talking and we could agree on a name, but that's part of the computation, not part of the hardware. Okay. That's the idea. So, what are we doing? We're giving up on CPU scaling. This is the history of computing. Clock goes faster, the bus gets wider, the memory gets bigger. All right? This is 1940 to 1970 or 80, something like that, whatever. And then, you know, so this clock is now going 3.6 gigahertz, and it's just too expensive to go any faster, or the pipeline just gets turned into uh, mush. So now we're doing this uh, multi-core thing, and we're all excited about that. You know, the stupidest phone has eight cores now. Is that ridiculous? Uh, uh, I mean, it's ridiculous, but I love it. Uh, uh. And the problem is, is now we have eight different caches, and each of these guys is reading and writing at the same time, and we have to coordinate all this information. Did you change it? Did you change it? Did you change it? And there are a little bit of research that's trying to make cache coherency cheaper, but you read between the lines and it doesn't actually work, not quite yet. Uh, so at the moment, cache coherency is basically quadratic uh, as you get more and more cores. Okay, so this is, it's a hack. It's a nice hack, but it's a hack nonetheless. And where we have to go is network scaling. We're now, instead of making the single CPU bigger and bigger and bigger, we say the CPU is not C anymore. There is no central processor. But we have endless, endless of these guys. And the goal is not to make each one as big as possible. The goal is to balance computation and communication in a way that's price competitive, that's economically advantageous. All right? So the goal is to switch to network scaling. So it's kind of like Internet. It has some feelings that are like Internet. But it's a personal Internet in a box. It's your Internet that's dedicated to you. And the processing units out here that touch the Internet, ew. You know, we reboot them every 10 minutes just on general principles, you know, that kind of thing. And they have to go from here to here to here to here to here, talking protocols, talking languages, making requests, not doing shared memory, boy, all the way across the whole thing, because we don't have that, only local connections, before they actually get to my medical information, before, God forbid, they get to my screen and could affect me, because I'm the most important thing in my internet in a box universe. See? We could have this. But we have to get started. We have to start springing the design bear traps to do it. All right, I don't have time to do this at all. Uh, um, ah, right, here's where it is. So what we're doing is we're renegotiating the contract between hardware and software. Instead of hardware guarantees reliability, software guarantees desirability, where hardware is best effort. It's going to try properly as directed by what the software says to do, but it doesn't guarantee to do so, and even its failure patterns are uncertain. That's to fill the hole. That's, so you can't say, tell me the error model. Sorry, is no error model. Have a nice day. Software, on the other hand, will make its best effort to make progress and accomplish whatever the user wants with a minimum amount of failures and with the minimum amount of damage when failures occur, while once again reserving the right to fail if it can't do anything else. And correctness, strict correctness is abandoned, and degrees of correctness becomes a quality rather than a requirement. Okay, and that's the story. Am I supposed to stop at 10 of or no, no, no. Well, I mean, go a little bit questions. more? You have a, you have 13 minutes to the end of the slot. All right. Depends on how much you want for questions. Should I push on a little bit more? Uh, uh, okay, a little bit more. Uh, um, oh, yeah, and I promised we were going to talk about this. That if we give up on things like, well, everybody knows it's x86 or ARM 7 TDMI sub 3 version 2, because ARM is always compatible. Uh, um, 
Now, <laughs> if instead we just fundamentally talk about physical devices performing computations, we can compare them on first principles. Uh, um, so here, I don't know if this is really readable. These are some basic, basic physical computation metrics that I made up to sort of study what we've got. Uh, the peak computational density, that's a row uh, sub s. The sub s means indefinitely scalable. That when you're measuring these things, you can't just measure it using three tiles. You have to measure it for three, and then three by three, and five by five, and seven by seven, and amortize until you get down to the price per tile, assuming it can be as big as possible. If you actually just measure it off a of one tile, you do not have a scalable notion of peak density and so forth. Okay? And so it's the tile compute speed divided by tile mass and measured in terms of instructions per gram second. Instructions per gram per second, like that. Okay, which is the obvious SI unit, uh, but um, it's, it's pretty big. Um, and has anybody ever read a science fiction book called Accelerando? A couple of folks. It, it, it's really, if you can tolerate science fiction, it's really very cool. Uh, um, and it's free. It's on the internet. Uh, um, in that, there is a unit, a slogan, how many MIPS per milligram? Uh, um, and a MIPS per milligram is just 10 to the ninth times rho, like that. So it's a more reasonable size unit. The peak power efficiency is rho divided by watts, how many instructions per milligram per second, I'm sorry, instructions per gram per second per watt of dissipated power. The peak communication velocity, this is a very important one, is in terms of the physics that you're simulating on the thing, the cellular automata that you're running on this thing, how long does it take for the first bit to get from the center of one tile to the host level, the center of the next tile, like that. Okay, so that's, it's a measure of the latency, but it actually matters how big the tile is. Smaller tiles will have a higher velocity, literal bit velocity, than bigger tiles. And then finally, the average event rate. The number of events per site, per second, that the cellular automata sees on a tile, all in, with the communication cost, the locking, whatever it is. And this is what we want to see. When we go out to buy our indefinitely scalable hardware, we're going to want to know, what's the air? What's the AER, the average event rate on this benchmark, on that benchmark? Question? So is that useful if you don't know the error rate? I mean, I could give you something great, but... It yeah, yeah, right, right, answers. right. My best effort and your best effort might be slightly different. Yeah, and the honest, the, the, the honest answer is that we have to nail down the contract between hardware and software to say what counts as a legitimate error rate. And so there's some number. One in 10 to the ninth events will fail, or something like that. And yet, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And again, it's got all the same problem like an instruction. These might be different instruction sets, different widths. How do you even compare instructions? To first order, though, we don't care. Right? Anything that could credibly be called best effort has got to be doing hundreds or thousands of instructions per error, or else everybody is going to go on Twitter and rag on whoever it is that claimed they had 100 air uh, with a success rate of 0.1. Okay. And just to say that we've got these things, here are a few hardware tiles that we can measure these parameters, or at least we can estimate them. I didn't really do it. Uh, so here is uh, HP65 that you'd make a, a, an indefinitely scalable grid out of it by laying a whole bunch of HP65s next to each other in space, and then you measure it. And you say, uh, uh, rho S, what's that? Oh yeah, the instructions per second per gram. Well, this thing weighs 215 grams or something, and it runs a couple thousand instructions a second, maybe. Uh, so the rho is about 10. Uh, the uh, communications velocity, the peak communications velocity is zero. It's got no actual way to talk from one calculator to another, and that's in fact a reason why it's not a very good tile. But that's a success story for our metrics, <coughs> because the metrics revealed that this was not a very good tile. This is called the Illuminato X Machina, the IXM. This is the tile that 
Uh, I developed with a company called Lex uh, Liquidware in 2009. It was briefly for sale. Uh, um, these four connectors connect laterally to four neighbors. Indefinitely scalable, as far as you want. We get numbers of around 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7, 10 to the 4th. This is the X minus XK1. It does a little better. Where the, the, way, the weight of this thing was what matters. Okay. So the point is we can already start drawing lines in the sand and comparing potential solutions for indefinitely scalable computer architectures. What we can't say here is what's the air? What's the average event rate? Because the software never got running on these. This guy doesn't even run it. And so on. We're just at the beginning. Question. So, the network. This one? Okay. This is essentially the same thing that it could be matched interconnected. Yes. Sure. And there is as long as we as long as we don't pretend there's wraparound or toroidal connections or anything like that. Or even in the new Xeon Phi processors, they, they have the notion of tiles. Yes, 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 yes absolutely. So the the Phi's. How is it different? And there is there technology that they are indefinitely scalable, but to, I mean, it's, a, it's a super it's an a, infinite computer, or the, nobody wants to pay for billions of. Well, yeah, yeah, I don't exactly so, want I mean, to pay for it, but uh, <laughs> uh, you give me a grant, then I will. No, uh, um, it's a great question, uh, um, and yes, two two uh, responses. Uh, number one, yeah, I mean this looks a lot like the Phi if we just filled this out in a five by five. Two things: uh, the bandwidth off chip is substantially less than the bandwidth on chip, right? So that whatever we get from these guys talking to these guys is not going to be the same that we're going to get from this guy going down to the balls and going over the board and coming to the Bandwidth thing. is money. Bandwidth is not about it, take on limits. It's right? latency. It's, it's limits. latency more than bandwidth. Again, for our peak communications velocity. Because we need to have these guys agree who is going to do an event on the edge. So bandwidth is a little important. But latency is a lot important. So that's point number one. Uh, um, and point number two, the practical problem, I mean, this is like an engineering question. Thank you. In the fives, in the cores on the fives, they ditch the instruction cache on the per core things. They're really small. And for the machine that I'm talking about, which I really didn't get to show you so much because we nerded out so hard, these guys are seriously mindy. They're doing very, very different things like that. And to do that, these guys all have to go out on the routing memory bus to pull in the instructions they're going to execute. So as a practical matter, they made the wrong decisions. They needed to make each individual core a little bigger, a little realer. But there's plenty of other things coming down the pipe. The Adaptiva people, the Parallela, made a similar mistake. But soon, especially if we know what we want, we'll get there. Other questions? So, on, on the software side of things, like in an embedded real-time system, you have software that, that you could call anytime algorithms, which are algorithms that if you give me more resources, I'll do a better job. But when you say time's up, I'll tell you what right. I know, when I know. Right. Just yeah, yeah. With it. Yeah, and they're sort of self-stabilizing in terms of the answers. Well, the question is that, you know, so the idea is that give me more and I'll do better. Yep. But that's not something that you're willing to grant. I would love, again, this goes back to if we had this secondary channel, if we had this urgency channel, then you'd be able to say, time's up. Give me an answer. Well, when you call time, it's up. You give me whatever you got, best answer you Yeah, got. yeah, yeah. But but that, we would have to implement that sort of purely as software. We'd have to make a protocol right. message saying, time's up, and so forth. And And I would like to push it lower. I would like to actually have signal lines that are signaling urgency between modules of the system. But that ecosystem at the somehow. level would be interesting. Yes, yes, it absolutely would. And, you know, so you think about things like how to compute the max in an on-demand way is, you know, it's like uh, just pick a number and return it. Uh, pick a random element of the array and return it. And if you have more time, pick another random A of the element and compare it to the one you've got. And if it's bigger, pick it like that. And as long as you have plenty of time, you'll end up returning the right answer, except when the one that you're holding gets corrupted. Ugh. So even that, even something as simple as find the max in a here's how much time you may have way, gets interesting. Other questions? Yeah. 
So I'm, I'm cheating. I was there yesterday. Cheater. But, um, so I saw, the, <laughs> I saw the demo. Yeah. yeah. If these things are not addressable, how do you initiate? Not globally addressable. Not globally. Well, right. Yeah. How do you initiate the, the, the program? Not how do you write the code. Right? Yeah. I can sort of imagine yeah. it, but my brain hurts. Yeah. But how do you how do you get the code in there? there there's two questions. Uh, number one is how do you get the sort of table of elements in there that says the properties of the fundamental types, and that's the laws of physics. And then number two, how do you get the initial condition in there to actually get it to run? And there's separate answers for both of those. And the idea is for the laws of physics, what you know is is they really shouldn't change very often. So you have a, a background neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor thing where you're saying, I'm running version 32 of the physics. What are you running? Oh, you're running 31? Here, copy mine. And the laws of physics opportunistically spread through the grid. And we had that built in as part of the fundamental model in the 2009 grid. They would update themselves dynamically on the fly, and then when they finished updating, they'd reboot to the new software, and everything would just keep going, and you could see the wave moving through the grid like that. To get the initial condition in, the thing is, in an indefinitely scalable architecture, there's no boot time. There's no power on time. Things are going on and off. The whole South 40 just got hit by lightning and went down. It'll be coming up in the next few minutes. There is no initial condition. There is only input. And that is however you make it happen. We are hoping, we don't know, it depends on the bill of materials, to have an accelerometer on our next generation tile. So, for example, you could just tap on the tile and that could be programmed to inject some atoms into the local cellular automata, which the processing could then grind up and say, ooh, I think there was a tap, like that. But fundamentally, that's going to be the system question of what are you doing with these guys. Last question? Um, so I see what you're trying to say with the Yay. bus lines and all that. <laughs> no, there's, uh -huh. there's one thing uh, when you're trying to solve practical problems is also the computational time. Yes. So are we doing all these at the expense of the time of computation, or do you think that will come in? Well, once again, there, time is only urgent when it's urgent, right? Lots of times, you know, you, you have a, a system control clock of 1,000 hertz or something like that. And all the modules have to report in comfortably faster than that, but that's it. There's no actual wind to be going way faster than that. And again, at the system level, then that's what we would like to push back. And the idea is, this particular model, and this is what people hate the most, is they say, energy, energy, energy. You've got all of these tiles, they've got clocks spun up, they're doing events over and over and over, even if the clock, even if the grid is mostly empty, you're wasting energy. And the answer is, yes indeed. Why? Because living systems, and this is my biological inspiration, they flourish when there's ample free energy. Living systems can survive when energy is tight, but they don't flourish. So for here, we're saying energy is a sunk cost. The cost to run all the tiles is already paid for. So in this framework, a cycle saved is a cycle wasted. So instead, rather than saying, ooh, I should stop the clock and save energy, we say, I should check my work. And then later on, we can say, okay, well, the fact is the voltage is now down to, you know, 3.7 volts, whatever it is. So now you've got to start pinching. But the design level wanted to be done where there's plenty. Last one. I'm struggling with my question, so bear with me. All right. I guess uh, so you're insisting with this one and still imputing general purpose computing. Is that correct? I, I'm in, what I'm really insisting is that we take a system level view. We come in with what is the system doing right, but I mean, you're, you're and work it down. And we would like, anybody. we would like the architecture, the hardware to be quite general with respect to systems that you could perhaps want to do. Yes. Is there any value in, in basically looking at the type of problems rather than dedicate the system that fits them? Yeah, yeah. Uh, certainly, uh, as a practical matter for initial uh, testing and demonstrations and so on, we sort of imagine playing with little robots, that kind of things, and just doing sort of basic system control in real time, because that's a natural fit for this sort of thing. 
But the hope is, is that, you know, once we say, wow, this is really cool, and look, you can chop the robot in half, and both halves go driving off, uh, uh, like that, that we say, well, I could take that architecture, and I could apply it to this, and this, and this, and this, and then it can specialize. And, you know, we've had 70 years of optimization for serial determinism. We've got to give this guy a chance. Folks, thanks so much for coming. Thanks so much for saving me.